Welcome, I'm Dr. Robin Gosher, and in this screencast, I'm going to briefly discuss what a spectrophotometric enzyme assay is. The screencast will focus on spectroscopy and the fundamentals of a spectroscopy experiment, and then how this applies to determining the activity or presence of an enzyme. So what is a spectrophotometric enzyme assay? You're probably wondering. Let's start with what is an assay. Assay is a scientific term for any kind of procedure. So assay is a procedure. And in these procedures, we're measuring the presence, is it there, the amount, how much, or the activity, what is it doing, of an analyte. And you'll recall that analyte is just the scientific term for a compound of interest. So we have an analyte that we're curious about, and in this case, it, the analyte is an enzyme. You'll recall that enzymes are proteins that have catalytic function. Catalytic function means that this protein happens to be a catalyst. It's folded in such a way that it's able to accelerate a reaction without itself being consumed as a reactant. And lastly, we have spectrophotometric. This is the use of light to make a measurement. So we have a spectrum where we have light of different wavelengths. We have photo, photons of light, and metric is a measurement. So spectrophotometry is any measurement based on light or the absorbance of light. In particular, we can combine all of these ideas together to mean that we're using light to measure the presence, amount, or activity of an analyte, this is an assay, where our analyte is a protein, or a protein with catalytic function and enzyme. Putting all of this together, spectrophotometric enzyme assays are using the absorbance of light to determine the activity or presence of an enzyme. So let's talk about the basic spectroscopy experiment. We always start with a light source. And this light source is going to give off a certain radiance, abbreviated I. After we have the light source, we need to be able to select a wavelength. And we'll use a monochromator in order to make that selection. And the monochromator is going to help us pick a wavelength of light. Within the visible range, we could always choose an individual color, such as red. If we're using light in the visible range, the spectroscopy experiment is sometimes also called colorimetry because the samples will be colored. You can also do spectroscopy with non-visible light, for example, with ultraviolet or with infrared light, but we aren't able to see that with the naked eye. So let's just say that we do choose red light and we pass that red light through our sample. Most of the time when we're doing spectroscopy, the sample is liquid and the sample has a certain concentration and that concentration is abbreviated C. And because we need to hold the liquid sample, we'll put it in a rectangular cuvette, such as the one shown here. So we have red light, and there's a fairly large intensity in abbreviated I0. The zero is because of the initial intensity or radiance of light. And then as it passes through the sample, the light interacts with the compound that we're interested in, with that analyte. And the analyte absorbs some of the light, and less of the light makes it through the sample, and we have intensity. Now, if we are doing colorimetry, we can actually see this, we can detect this with a naked eye because we'll see the change in the color intensity. But usually we will use an instrument that has a photo detector, it's much more sensitive than our eye, and we will usually read out the data using a computer. Um, often we'll go and we will use different wavelengths and we will measure the absorbance, the quantity of light that makes it through at each of the wavelengths. We're then able to plot a spectrum where we have absorbance of the sample versus the wavelength that we're talking about. Okay. Now, on the next slide, I'm going to explain a little bit the difference between the terminology absorbance, which you see labeled here, and what's actually experimentally measured, which is called transmittance. Transmittance is this very simple con concept. It's the ratio of the light that makes it through the sample, I, divided by the light that was originally incident on the sample, I0. So why do we use absorbance and not transmission? This is actually simply a matter of convenience. Transmission happens to decay exponentially with increasing concentration. And that's plotted right here, where we have percent transmission versus concentration. And the less compound you have, the more light will be transmitted. And as the concentration increases, you're going to lose transmission, and it happens to be lost at an exponential rate. Um, come see me in my office hours if you want details on why it's exponential. Um, 
the essence, though, is that we really don't like exponentials. They're hard. Um, it's much easier for humans to understand that as absorbance, as concentration increases, we should have this linear increase of what we're measuring. And absorbance is masterfully good at that. Um, so we have to really define absorbance to be a linear increase. And therefore, we have to get rid of the exponential by having a log term. And we also have to get rid of the downward slope and turn that downward slope into a positive slope. So there are two ways of doing that. And the first one is to flip the ratio. So that I0 goes from being in the bottom of transmission to being in the top, the numerator of absorbance. Or we can leave this ratio the same. It can still be exactly as it was for transmission. Put that right in there in the log term and just put a negative in front of it. And that's usually how people do this, because absorbance is the negative log of transmission. Now, the actual practical thing that we come out of this is Beer's Law, where absorbance is linearly related to concentration, abbreviated C, and the slope of that relationship, how much light is absorbed for how much concentration, is also including two other terms. And in Beer's Law, the two other terms are epsilon, and epsilon is the molar absorptivity liters per mole per centimeter. And that is a description of kind of the characteristic of the molecule. How much light does it in particular absorb per molecule? The other factor is that we have B, also sometimes called L. And B is the path length of the sample or cuvette, usually in centimeters. So that's this distance right here. Ultimately, Beer's Law says that there is this linear relationship between absorbance and concentration. And this is very useful for us. OK, back to the spectrophotometric enzyme assay. The simplest description of this is we have a reactant that becomes a product, and you have an enzyme causing this to happen. The enzyme is that catalyst. It's not really a reactant. It's not really a product. It is right over the top of that arrow as the catalyst. So in order for us to use spectroscopy to measure the activity of this enzyme, the enzyme's ability to make a reactant into a product, something here has to absorb light. And the real question is, which thing should it be? Should the reactant absorb the light? Should the enzyme absorb the light, the product? Which one? Well, you're probably already thinking that the enzyme is not a great candidate for absorbing light. Um, we want to know if the enzyme is there. OK. How much enzyme do I have? Concentration related to absorbance, that's nice. But enzymes can be present and not active. We're thinking more about the activity. Is the enzyme causing this reaction from reactant to product to occur? So the better two choices are for the reactant to absorb the light, in which case, as the enzyme is acting, you're going to lose reactant and lose absorbance. Or, alternatively, the product can absorb the light. And as the enzyme is acting, you'll be creating more product and increasing that absorbance due to the product. So these are the two versions of a spectrophotometric enzyme assay. Now we're finally on our last slide. So we take the idea of a reactant going to a product via the activity of an enzyme. And I'll talk about an example. The example is where we have an enzyme called lacase. And lacase is used in nature to break down phenolic residues, such as things that are in lignin in wood. And we can determine whether the lacase is active by reacting it with a much more simple molecule called ABTS. ABTS, you don't need to know what it is, but what you do need to know is that both the ABTS and the lacase are colorless. And the only thing in here that has any color whatsoever is the product, which has a beautiful green-blue color. So as the lacase enzyme is going to act on the ABTS, both of these have no color, it'll produce the oxidized ABTS and will have an increase in the green-blue color. Many times we do these spectroscopy enzyme assays using what's called a plate reader, and one of these is shown here. Plate readers are simply spectrometers that are designed to analyze many, many samples in an array. And what's shown here is the schematic of a 96 well plate, and here's a photo of one of them where you have a lot of small wells in a plastic plate, and you're able to pass the light from the top to the bottom, or through the top and bottom of the sample in order to read the absorbance. 
And here you'll see that with increasing concentration of the lacase, we're able to convert more of that ABCS to the oxidized product. So I hope that this has been a very useful video for you, and I appreciate your attention.